the 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 rule of thumb is that 50% of the total spend is going to show up in the form of local economic stimulation. What is a community microgrid? Why is a community microgrid more than a microgrid? And how can a microgrid be a solution to sourcing up to 50% of your community's power from rooftop solar? Today, John Farrell answers these questions and more as he talks to Craig Lewis, the executive director of the Clean Coalition, about the Clean Coalition's planned community microgrids in New York and California. This is Local Energy Rules, a podcast sharing powerful stories about local renewable energy. So microgrids are, you know, as you know, obviously, but maybe our listeners don't, kind of a, a, a subset of the grid, an area of the grid that can um, operate independently if necessary uh, when the larger grid goes down, but can also be managed locally. Most of the things that people think of when they think of microgrids are often like just a diesel generator, say for a hospital that will provide backup power. How are the microgrids that Clean Coalition is working on different? For example, the Long Island Community Microgrid Project. Yes, the Clean Coalition is focused on two types of microgrids, both of which are very different than, you know, a traditional uh, backup power scenario that would be powered by a diesel generator or any other fossil fuel uh, source for that matter. The Clean Coalition's microgrid uh, efforts are really summed up in our community microgrid initiative. We call it the CMI. Uh, I'll try to stay away from acronyms here on the on the podcast, but uh, the Community Microgrid Initiative is really focused on getting community microgrids in place. And a community microgrid is very different than a traditional microgrid uh, in the sense that it is taking a, it has a footprint across a significant portion of the distribution grid. So, for example our community microgrid project in Long Island, what we call the Long Island Community Microgrid Project, is taking a grid area that is served by an entire, or the entire grid area served by a substation, and that grid area encompasses several thousand customers, both uh, residential and commercial, and has a very significant load and our community microgrid is designed to provide renewable power to in, in a very significant way to that entire grid area. So we're talking about enough renewables to get 50% of the total energy consumed over the course of a year from local renewables. And then using energy storage, demand response, and some other distributed energy resources uh, and techniques to essentially provide indefinite power backup to critical facilities within that grid area if the, uh, if the transmission grid goes down or if one of the feeders that are coming out of the substation go down. We have a way to make sure that the um, distributed energy resources, including the, the, the local renewables within our community microgrid, can be reconfigured to serve just those critical facilities. But on a daily basis, daily normal operational basis, all of those assets are being used to optimize the grid operations and um, and, and minimize costs to ratepayers. Because when you optimize grid operations, that means you're doing it, it, you're, you're, you're getting the highest performance at the least cost. And that means the, the most significant benefits to ratepayers. You know, your Long Island Community Microgrid Project is, I think, being facilitated by some of the regulatory changes that are happening in New York. New York is mentioned frequently as a place where the the market structure for electricity is being substantially changed. I know there are some incentives in New York and other New England states for microgrids. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, the barriers that face microgrid development and how New York's, you know, regulatory changes and incentives are helping address those barriers? The, the, the market mechanisms do not exist for deploying community microgrids. They only exist today for doing standard microgrids, which are microgrids behind a customer meter. And, the, and, and so the Clean Coalition has a very significant um, uh, challenge ahead of it. And, and we're, we're, we're you know, somewhere at the early stages of, of, of resolving that challenge in New York. But I'll tell you, one of the one of the biggest um, 
barriers we're seeing is that in the case of New York, they have they've been very ambitious about jumping ahead to try to um, force, uh, you know, kind of open ownership models around the grid, these distributed energy resource assets, which at the end, you know, ultimately the Clean Coalition is very much about let's have an open market and let's make sure that anybody can own these assets. But right now the market mechanisms don't exist for third party ownership of community microgrid related distributed energy resources um, other than the generating assets uh, like the solar, um, you know, can be purchased through a feed-in tariff. Um, but other than that, there's no market mechanism for third-party ownership for the energy storage, for example. Uh, so anything that you would ideally want to put on the utility side of the meter um, is, is uh, very challenged right now in terms of, of finding a market mechanism that is going to allow that to happen. And the policymakers in New York have kind of jumped to this conclusion of let's let's just, you know, force third party ownership. Let's not let the utilities have any play in this game of owning the assets. And that creates a couple of really significant problems. And 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 luckily, you know, we Clean Coalition has a very close relationship with the policymakers in New York, and we're we're working with them to find a way to make sure that we can prove out the community microgrid approach, um, which again is an entirely new way of designing and operating the electric grid. Uh, and then once we prove it out on a on a physical layer, right? Here's the physical capability of these distributed energy resources uh, acting in a coordinated and, 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 and synergistic way, um, then we can design market mechanisms. But if you try to design market mechanisms before you know what the technologies are capable of, you end up with very suboptimal outcomes in, in the ultimate marketplace. So we're, we're trying to convince the policymakers in New York that for the initial projects, the pilot projects that are proving out community microgrid approach, we need to be we need to incentivize everybody to cooperate and participate, including the in, in incumbent utilities. And then you, then we can we can analyze the operational uh, effectiveness of these distributed energy resources and understand the full extent of the benefits they bring to the grid and to the ratepayers and then design market mechanisms that are going to really drive the future in, in the most uh, uh, optimal way and in the you know, fastest possible time frame. You know, what's clear about a traditional microgrid is that that control system and that management is really to the benefit of that microgrid operator alone. And the, the thing about the community microgrid I'm, I'm gathering here that's so different is that when the grid goes down, there are certain entities that are going to continue to have power as a result of that control system. But when the grid is up, those resources are really integrated and and for the benefit of all of the customers at that substation in terms of managing load efficiently and 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 providing power when it's needed. So that that's a fairly significant distinction between the community and the individual microgrid. That's exactly right, John, and and. And the 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 the, the you know kind of uh, resilience benefits of a community microgrid can can provide benefits to the entire community in a couple of different ways. One is that if you have a transmission outage, so so I, I know you know this, but for the benefit of of your listeners, John, I'll, I'll just you know describe it simply. You have transmission lines that come into a substation, and you have distribution lines that come out of the substation. Um, the transmission lines are high voltage and visually they're generally steel power poles, you know, steel tower power poles. Uh, and uh, the, the voltage levels are very high. Um, the, 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 the distribution lines that come out of the substation are usually wood power poles. The voltages are much lower. Um, and then your, your, you know, di your distribution lines are, are, are you know, basically serving um, the actual customers. Uh, you've got to be at low voltages in order to serve a customer. So you've got the wood power poles. Basically, when you look around your neighborhoods and your um, your, your your areas where people live and work, right? You see wood power poles. Um, so so what happens if the if the transmission grid comes down? If the transmission line goes down, then the 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 entire community microgrid can keep itself on 
the entire, every single customer, every single load, people can be completely oblivious to the fact that the transmission line, you know, a transmission line just went down. And, but your energy storage is going to be uh, somewhat limited. Energy storage is still relatively expensive. You can't, you can't have so much energy storage in place, uh, at least not economically, such that you can keep everybody online for 24 hours. Um, so at some point you need to make a decision if the transmission line goes down, how long are you going to keep everybody, you know, the, every single customer on uh, before you start shutting down some of your non-prioritized loads um, because you don't want to deplete your, your energy storage. And the, um, the answer to that is you probably are going to only keep everybody on for maybe 15 or 30 minutes um, while you determine whether the, the transmission grid outage is, is likely to be a short-term or a long-term situation. If it's short-term, you might continue to ride through, keep everybody on. But if you determine that this is likely to be several hours or maybe even days, then you are you know, going to shut down your non-prioritized loads as fast as you can and preserve that energy storage uh, for your, your prioritized loads. And you can have different levels of prioritized loads as well. So for example, you might have a uh, school that, that could serve as a emergency, um, could serve as an emergency center, but it's not a designated emergency center. So that school you might keep on um, you know, as a kind of a secondary prioritized load, but then if you start to hit energy storage levels where you need to keep your true, you know, your, your, your identified highest prioritized loads online, then you may need to shut even those secondary prioritized loads off. So you, you can have a prioritization scheme on the, 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 the loads across the entire um, uh, tar, you know, grid area. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, in the conversation in particular about this relationship between the larger grid and the local, uh, one thing I find very interesting about this is whether or not there is some tension at all between, you know, the, the traditional design of the grid, or at least that we've had for the past several decades, is these, you know, large centralized power plants and then the transmission lines that you mentioned, you know, providing bulk delivery of that power to the urban centers where we use electricity. You know, microgrids, like the community microgrids you're talking about, have a lot more localized power generation. Is there then some tension between the operation or the the maintenance of this transmission network or the fees that are assessed uh, for access to that transmission network and the local renewable power that's being produced by community microgrids? Yes, there is tension, and that tension is going to increase as 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 the the the, the distributed energy resources continue to get deployed in more significant ways. Right now, distributed energy resources represent, you know, maybe a couple percent of the total electricity consumed in the United States. So it's it's really a, a very small percentage of the total. But as we get microgrids and, and, and microgrids enable significant levels of local renewables, that percentage of the energy mix that's going to come from distributed energy resources is going to drastically increase. And as it increases your need for central generation resources and for transmission um, uh, uh, infrastructure, transmission infrastructure go way down. Right, they, 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 it's, it's, it is a zero sum game. You, you, if you can, if you can, you know, source your energy needs locally, then you don't need to source them remotely. And the, and, and so increasingly, this there's going to be tension here. Um, the Long Island Community Microgrid Project is a is a good is a is an excellent case study in in this uh, trade off because our uh, Long Island Community Microgrid Project design is going to require an investment of about $25 million for the energy storage and the monitoring communication control solutions, which would also enable um, some, some demand response. And the, um, the, the, the project itself, the Long Island Community Microgrid Project from day one, eliminates the need to make an investment of over $30 million in new transmission upgrades and, and new infrastructure. So right from day one, we're talking about investing $25 million 
for enabling the the Long Island Community Microgrid project and offsetting the need for over thirty million dollars in transmission infrastructure. So you, you it's on full display this tension that is clearly um, you know at work. And and as examples like the Long Island Community Microgrid project get publicized and and people start to really scrutinize you know where they're going to invest their next dollar in 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 the electric grid is it going to be in distributed energy resources or is it going to be in transmission infrastructure and central generation um, it starts to become a lot more clear that that distributed energy resources is the superior uh, approach in many cases and 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 you get the added benefits of resilience when you have local renewables and other distributed energy resources at play that you cannot get when you have a central generalized just a central generation model you're just never going to you can't provide local resilience if you're getting all your resources from remote locations the remote generation does not help you from a local resilience standpoint and and i think that leads really well into the next question that i had about you know how community microgrids or distributed energy resources you know, can enhance the economic returns for customers in that substation area from electric generation. And I think, you know, the contrast between that and the centralized generation is probably what um, what will stand out for most people. Yes. Well, it's, it's a really a great question. The economic stimulation that local renewables and other distributed energy resources bring to a community is essentially the, the, the rule of thumb that the Clean Coalition has determined after doing some very significant benefits analysis associated with our, our various community microgrid projects, including um, most extensively our Hunters Point community microgrid project in San Francisco. The, the, the rule of thumb is that 50% of the total spend is going to show up in the form of local economic stimulation and a very significant portion of that of that local economic stimulation is going to be in the form of local wages so we're talking when we're talking about local renewables and other distributed energy resources which by definition are local <laughs> they're distributed energy resources are on the distribution grid so they're local they're where people live and work and 50% of the total deployment cost is going to uh, stim be, 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 is going to proliferate into the local economy in the form of local wages. And, and then there's also a contribution to uh, local rents. So for example, um, in our Long Island Community Microgrid Project, we're talking about uh, about uh, roughly 15 megawatts of local solar. All of that local solar will be procured through a feed-in tariff that we helped design out there in Long Island a couple of years ago. And a feed-in tariff means the utility is just buying the energy. A third party will own all of those uh, local renewable assets. Uh, so the solar facilities, for example, will be owned by third parties and will simply sell the energy to the, the, the utility. The, the, those, those solar facilities are interconnected directly to the distribution grid selling energy. But the parties that are gonna own those, those feed and tariff uh, solar projects essentially are either pro existing property owners or they're going to be uh, third party owners of the solar facilities that are renting roof space or, or air rights on top of a, of a parking structure or parking lot uh, and paying rent to whoever the property owner is. And so that's that's money that injects into the local economy as well. So, so, but the biggest contribution by far is the fact that when you have local renewables and, and other distributed energy resources, you generally are going to hire local installers and local people to do the operation and maintenance on those facilities and that injects uh, local wages into the into the uh, uh, regional economies. So, uh, Craig, I'm going to change the question that I sent you ahead of time. It's a moderator's privilege, I guess. But what I'm really curious about is what's the maybe the one policy change that if you could enact, I don't know if it's at a state level or a federal level, that would really open the door to more community microgrid development, whether it's in New York or in other states. <laughs> 
Yeah, that is a great question. The gosh, there's I've got a handful that I would like to to see uh, you know happen. Um, I think that the 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 if I if I could only pick one, it would be to enable um, the 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 purchase of wholesale um, energy from distributed energy resources in a manner that is based on um, um, uh, not just kilowatt hours. So uh, there's a couple of different ways to, to reward that, that, you know, that market mechanisms can be designed to reward the provisioning of, of grid services. Uh, the default has been to reward kilowatt hours, which is, which is just real power. You know, it's, 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 it's real power, but there's, in addition to real power, we have reactive power that is extremely valuable for voltage support. Um, we also have the need to provide grid services that help balance uh, the frequency on the grid. And, and there's really three dimensions of, of the grid that need to be in balance at all times. You need to balance the amount of power, right? The amount of power that's being used by everybody's lights and other electric loads uh, needs to be balanced with the amount of power that's being injected into the grid at any instant in time. Uh, but we also have to balance voltage. Voltage has a very tight tolerance of, of, of where that voltage level needs to be across the entire grid. And we also need to balance frequency. And when we start talking about balancing voltage and frequency, we start talking about um, uh, other uh, uh, dimensions of, of power that need to be procured that are not uh, measured in kilowatt hours. They're measured in kilovars. In particular, I think one, one thing that I, you didn't say, but I... I'm guessing is true here is that this is the difference between distributed and centralized resources is that providing these other services is something that those distributed resources can do better than centralized resources, which is another reason why we need to change that pricing structure. Am I right there? You are absolutely right there. And the I'll give you a couple of quick examples. When it comes to providing frequency balancing, the most important metric is speed, how fast you can react to a need for keeping the frequency in balance. And there's nothing that can react faster than fast, you know, than fast responding energy storage. So you can inject large amounts of, ener of energy out of a battery and you can, you can, you can also um, you know, be a, a sink, right? You can, you can, you can charge the battery, which pulls energy off of the grid. And you can do that also in a, in a very rapid time frame. literally in, in, you know, in kind of, we're talking about second and sub second level speeds. You cannot get that kind of reaction time out of a fossil generating power plant. You certainly can't get it out of a, of a nuclear power plant. So there's there's this tremendous ability to have to do frequency balancing with distributed energy resources that currently doesn't exist out there, and there's no market mechanisms to make sure that the distributed energy resources are being incentivized and being compensated for that for that for that benefit that they can bring to the grid. The the example I'm going to use for um, balancing voltage is that voltage is the most important metric when it comes to balancing voltage is location. The um, voltage is balanced through reactive power and reactive power decays very quickly over distance when, when it's you know, over distance across transmission and or across uh, distribution lines. And so the, the, the maximum value of, of, of provisioning, of providing of voltage balancing is definitely superior for distributed energy resources because uh, re reactive power requirements or voltage balancing requirements are almost entirely load driven. It's when somebody turns on a, a motor, you have this, this big spike in needing reactive power to, to smooth that, 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 that motor turning on. And the, um, uh, and you have voltage drop as you, as you go across, you know, go, go, further away from your, your generating source, you have voltage drop across, you know, both transmission and, and, and distribution lines. So getting the, getting the distributed energy resources where you need that voltage support is critical. 
Well, Craig, thank you so much for joining me. Where, if folks care about community microgrids, distributed renewable energy, they want to know more about these market mechanisms that can expand them, where should they go? I think a, a starting point is the Clean Coalition website, which is uh, www.clean-coalition.org. And we have a, if, if, you, if somebody goes to the Clean Coalition homepage and just types in the search bar for community microgrids or microgrids, there'll be many links that, that, that come up and somebody could spend easily spend 15 minutes and probably gain a whole lot of knowledge in, in a short period of time. But if they want to become experts, they could spend, you know, the full day and basically, uh, you know, walk away with uh, essentially a, a pretty significant level of expertise. So we, we've got lots of resources on the Clean Coalition website and uh, would encourage folks to start there. That was John Farrell, ILSR's Director of Democratic Energy, talking with Craig Lewis, the Executive Director of the Clean Coalition. More information on microgrids and their macro potential and macro barriers can be found on ILSR's new report, Mighty Microgrids, on ILSR.org. There you can also find more Local Energy Rules podcasts. Until next time, keep your energy local, and thanks for listening.